Hey guys, my name is Atif Shanawaz. I'm an internal medicine doctor and I make videos explaining medical concepts in layman's terms. Today we're talking about blood clots and why they happen, specifically DVTs and PEs. DVT stands for deep vein thrombosis and PE stands for pulmonary embolism. A thrombosis is what we call a blood clot. And when that blood clot dislodges and it moves around the body and it gets stuck somewhere, that is called an embolism. By the end of this video, you'll understand why these clots happen, what the symptoms are, and why these two locations, the legs and the lungs, are singled out as common sites of clot formation. In the video after this one, I'll be talking about how these clots are diagnosed and how we treat them. If you're interested in seeing more content from this channel, please click on that subscribe button and also click on that bell icon next to it so you don't miss out on any new content when it comes out. Whenever there is a cut to the skin and bleeding from a wound, the blood immediately activates complex biochemical machinery to turn that ordinary liquid blood into a solid clot at the site of the wound. There are many proteins involved in this process. Most of them are named, to keep things simple, after Roman numerals. A large number of reactions and interactions occur in what has been called the coagulation cascade, which has terrified medical students for decades because this cascade is inevitably featured in biochemistry tests. One of the most common reasons that clots form when they shouldn't form is because of genetics. Patients who have a genetic predisposition to forming clots have issues with some part of this complex cascade, causing it to trigger inappropriately when blood is still inside the body and bleeding isn't occurring at all. The most common genetic mutation affects factor V. A mutation to the gene that codes for factor V results in a slightly altered protein that is then called factor V Leiden, named by the way after the city of Leiden in the Netherlands, where the mutation was first uncovered in the 1990s. The second most common mutation affects the prothrombin factor, and together factor V Leiden and prothrombin mutations account for about half of all known genetic mutations that lead to increased risk of clots. Other mutations, such as defect in protein C and protein S and antithrombin, account for most of the remaining cases, but just to be clear, the presence of these mutations does not mean that a clot will definitely happen. For instance, only 5% of patients with factor V Leiden will ever develop a blood clot. It's just that having these mutations confers an increased risk. And we physicians refer to this condition of increased risk of clot formation as a hypercoagulable state. So a genetic mutation affecting the coagulation cascade is one factor contributing to increased clot formation because it alters the chemistry of the coagulation cascade. But there are other scenarios that result in a hypercoagulable state as well. Cancer is a well-recognized one. About 20% of patients who develop a clot have cancer, and sometimes the cancer is discovered after the clot has formed. Any kind of cancer can do this, but lung, colon, and pancreatic cancer are amongst the most common culprits. Another well-recognized risk factor for a hypercoagulable state is the use of contraception containing estrogen and progestin. However, even while using them, the absolute risk still remains low. An estimated one clot event per 10,000 women per year, which is a very low number, but because hormone-containing contraceptives are so widely used, there are still many women who develop clots because of their effect on the cascade. Now, there's a lot of talk about hormonal contraception causing clots, so keep in mind that pregnancy also causes a hypercoagulable state at the rate of about 85 per 100,000 pregnancies. So those are situations where a hypercoagulable state can occur because the chemistry of the cascade doesn't work quite the way it's supposed to, but there are a couple of other mechanisms that can cause clots as well. Another mechanism entirely is trauma, and that should make some intuitive sense. Injuries from falls or car accidents as well as surgeries will damage tissue and can result in bleeding. That bleeding at the site of injury will rev up the cascade and make it act like a hair trigger, not needing much of an excuse to form a clot inside the veins even when the bleeding has stopped. The greater the level of trauma, the greater the risk of clot formation. A third mechanism is simple stagnation of blood in the body, meaning that the blood isn't flowing fast enough. Now, we all need our blood to keep flowing around the body. It's not good when it stagnates anywhere. If it does, it can lead to a clot formation. So prolonged periods of immobility is a well-recognized third mechanism of clot formation. And this principle explains why patients with trauma and patients after surgery 
are at such high risk of forming clots because not only is their injury increasing the risk, but in addition, those patients aren't usually moving around very well either. And it's for this reason that the vast majority of patients who are hospitalized, even if it is not for trauma, get some kind of a blood thinner to prevent clots from forming. And it doesn't take a long period of immobility either. We're not talking about days. It can be as little as eight hours sometimes. In fact, prolonged sitting on a computer can cause clots, something that's been called e-thrombosis. And long flights can do the same thing, a condition that's been called economy class syndrome. Now this also explains why most blood clots appear in the veins and not the arteries. As you may already know, the blood flow in the arteries is much faster because that blood is coming out of the beating heart, whereas blood in the veins is returning to the heart. In fact, when we talk about blood pressure, we're talking about the pressure in the arteries, not the veins. The pressure in the veins is much, much lower. Now let's get into why these clots seem to affect the legs and the lungs. In order to understand this, let's quickly go over some aspects of the human circulation. You may already know that we have veins that you can see on the skin, but these veins are actually very superficial. There's a large network of much deeper and larger veins within the body that drain large organs and tissues. In fact, the superficial veins that are visible from the skin eventually join with the deeper system. And this is where the words deep vein in the term deep vein thrombosis comes from. All of the blood in this venous system makes its way to the right side of the heart. And let me remind you that the heart is actually divided into a right side and a left side. Generally speaking, arteries come out of the left side to provide oxygen-rich blood to the whole body, whereas the right side receives venous blood. And after taking in this venous blood, the right side then pumps the blood into the lungs where this oxygen-poor blood has oxygen put back into it. So imagine if a clot develops in a vein and then that clot, once having formed, gets dislodged. When it gets dislodged, it will flow in the venous system until it reaches the right side of the heart, and then from there it will get pumped into the lungs where it finally gets stuck, unable to move past any further in the lung tissue, resulting in a pulmonary embolism. Now, the reason that these deep clots occur in the legs is a rather straightforward one, and it has everything to do with gravity. The blood has a long way to go from the legs to the heart, and all the while it's resisting gravity to make the return journey. The motion of the legs as we walk and move around actually helps the blood to make that return journey, so when a person is relatively immobile, this blood flow slows down, even when a patient is laying down. When the DVTs are in the legs, we call those lower extremity DVTs, and these are by far the most common site of DVTs, although we do see them occurring in the pelvis and sometimes in the gut as well. So as you can see, a pulmonary embolism, or PE, is really a clot that started somewhere else and ended up in the lung because that is how the body happens to be wired. It has nothing to do with the health of the lungs itself. Now, a lot of patients ask me if a blood clot in the lung means that the patient might also be having a stroke or a heart attack, and the short answer to this question is no. Both strokes and heart attacks occur due to blockages in the arteries supplying those organs and not the veins. DVTs and PEs are problems that occur in the venous side of circulation and not in the arterial side. Having said that though, there is some suggestion that if and only if there is an abnormal communication between the right side of the heart and the left side of the heart, the so-called hole in the heart, then theoretically, the clot could move over from the right side over towards the left, escaping into the arterial system and then potentially going into the brain and causing a stroke. However, the data on this is somewhat mixed and there's no real consensus on whether something like this actually happens on a frequent basis. A lower extremity DVT will cause swelling, pain, and redness as the clot plugs up the circulation and blood gets backed up in the leg. The pain is not universally present, but the swelling usually is, although there are cases of DVTs being found in patients without any of these symptoms, but that is not very common. Most of the time, DVTs occur only in one leg, so a patient that comes in with sudden swelling of just one leg will definitely need a workup for a DVT. Now, while the symptoms of a DVT are relatively straightforward, PEs are a different matter entirely. Let's get the obvious symptoms out of the way, which are a sudden onset of shortness of breath and chest pain, which is usually pleuritic, which means that the pain worsens with deep breathing. Another symptom that we might see are coughing and wheezing, which as you can imagine are very non-specific symptoms. Patients with a PE might have an elevated heart rate as well as a heart tries to pump against the resistance in the lungs caused by the clot being lodged there. But as is the case with almost every symptom of a PE, that doesn't have to happen. Symptoms of a 
good PE can be vague and sometimes really surprising. I've seen patients with massive PEs who just have a mild cough, and I've seen patients with much smaller ones who actually end up with cardiac arrest. In fact, the potential vagueness of PE symptoms is a well-recognized problem amongst clinicians. And as you can imagine, it's one of those diagnoses that's sometimes difficult to make when basing it on symptoms alone. And one of the ways that we approach the diagnosis of a PE is to consider if the patient has risk factors for a PE to begin with. In other words, does this patient have a hypercoagulable state? Did they recently have surgery or some other trauma? Were they recently immobile? And that information is considered at least as important as the symptoms are when trying to assess if we need to be worried about a patient having a PE and doing the appropriate test to find out. Speaking of tests, the next video will go over how we diagnose DVTs and PEs and also go through the treatment options. Listen, if you found value in this video, please hit that like button as it really helps the channel grow. And if you have any questions or comments on anything I've discussed here, please feel free to put those down in the comment section. I would love to hear back from you. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you all in the next video.